it looks like we can go ahead and get started, Mayor Bennett. Thank you, Aaron. I'll call this meeting to order of the Board of the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, uh, as permitted by the Governor's Disaster De Declaration dated April 29th, 2022. The determination has been made that an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent for this board to ensure a transparent and open meeting as possible. The meeting materials were posted one week in advance. A recording of this meeting will be provided and linked to our website and all votes will be taken by roll call. Aaron, please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor Bennett. Present. Frank Beal. Present. President Brawley. Present. Uh, Mayor Darch. Present. Paul Goodrich. Present. Jim Healy. Present. Can you hear me? Yes, we can Loud hear and you. clear. Oh, great, finally. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Nina Edamudia. Present. Mayor Noak. President Reinbold. Present. Uh, Mayor Rotering. Present. Stephen Schaefer. Present. Carolyn Schofield. Present. Ann Sheehan. Here. Matt Walsh. Diane Williams, Leanne Redden. Present. Uh, Dr. Kouros Mohamadian. Present. Thank you. We have okay, a quorum. And before you are the minutes of our March meeting, you're going to call the roll on approval of the minutes. If there's no questions, none I being, go ahead. Motion. I'm sorry, yes. So moved, Reinbold. And a second. Second, Darge. I moved and seconded. Again, any questions? If not, Aaron, call the roll. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Frank Beal? Yeah, aye. President Brawley? Aye. Mayor Darch? Aye. Paul Goodrich? Aye. Jim Healy? Aye. Nina Edamudia? Aye. Mayor Noak? President Reinbold? Aye. Mayor Rotering? Aye. Stephen Schaefer? Aye. Carolyn Schofield? Aye. Ann Sheehan? Aye. Matt Walsh? And Diane Williams? Uh, the motion carries. First item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report. Erin. All right. Thank you so much. I will um, just ask the Chair to recognize that Mayor Noak has joined the call. Apologies for the Shall trouble be. getting on. So uh, getting my notes here so I make sure I cover the things I'm supposed to cover. Um, you know, we have had a couple new key positions filled here at the agency, so I wanted to just start off by introducing them to the board here. Um, we have talked to you before about our new portfolio of work to address ADA transition plans in the region, a federal requirement that we're not currently meeting. And to advance this work, we've brought on a director of regional ADA planning and local safety. Linda Massandria had joined us about a week or two ago. She will be leading the agency's program to develop and implement around uh, ADA Title II compliance across the region and the local components of our safety action work that we've been working on. Uh, she really brings a strong experience um, that will certainly help us achieve our ADA goals. She's not only a licensed attorney, but she most recently served as the director of the Office of Disability Integration and Coordination at the Federal Emergency Management Associate, um, Administration, so in DC. She was a principal advisor on issues impacting people with disabilities during, before, and after disasters. She has an extensive background in interpreting laws and rules, regulations, implementing policies, and procedures and programs. So we um, are so thrilled to have her on the team. She's also a strategic visionary planner, a change agent, and a spokesperson on these issues. We are so excited to have her here and look forward to having her work with you, your councils, your organizations. As we get this program up and running, we know that we need to do quite a bit of work to talk to our partners across the, the region. So if you have folks that Linda should be meeting with, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'll make that introduction. Um, and she is uh, well connected to the Chicago community already, knows a number of our stakeholders. Um, and in fact, we were at the Active Transportation Alliance's annual um, meeting, and you know, I think she was reconnecting with folks like Karen Tamley from uh, who used to be the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities um, uh, director there as well. So we're thrilled to have her on board. 
We also have a new communications and engagement deputy executive director, uh, Jenny Vanna. Jenny is a leader in her field, brings extensive government communications and engagement and outreach experience to CMAP. Um, most recently, she led communications for the city of Des Plaines um, and also has served as Lake County's chief communications officer for more than 12 years. So she started with the agency in late March. We're looking forward to working with her. She's waving and saying hello. Um, Thanks so much to the board members who were able to join us at the City Club on April 27th. You know, in my speech, I really talked about the future of transportation across our region, what CMAP is doing, how we are doing it, but most importantly, I wanted to focus on who we're doing it for. I talked about the tremendous opportunities with the new infrastructure law, the opportunity to make significant investments in bridges and aging infrastructure, traffic safety, charging infrastructure for electric vehicles, and innovative uses of public spaces. I also pointed out that these new funds bring in really big opportunities related to um, the mega projects, the big multi-billion dollar projects that we have in our long range plan. And those projects you know, really aren't just one about one community or one place, they're about our economic vitality, about the movement of people and goods here. Uh, talked about the opportunity for us to think about 290 reconstruction as a multimodal project and combining that with the CTA blue line improvements. So, in my written report that you'll receive, you'll get a link to the video of the speech. I hope that we left people inspired about thinking about how we move people across our region. Another event that I was at recently that I left personally inspired by was um, a visioning session that was held with the Board of Directors at the Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, or AASHTO. You know, there's a lot of synergies and momentum and alignment amongst our transportation leaders at state DOTs. We remain collectively committed to focusing on people, and I think that was one of the surprising takeaways from that meeting is that the board of AASHTO is thinking about moving people, thinking about resiliency, thinking about uh, technology, safety, climate, you know, and really our economic resiliency as well, and how we embed those community values into our visions and our planning for future infrastructure. So speaking of values and value-based plans, we are coming to a few key milestones on the ONTO 2050 plan update for late October approval. Um, later on the agenda, you'll hear from staff who will provide more details and information on this, but I wanted to highlight a few key takeaways. Our core principles identified in ONTO 2050, inclusive growth, resilience, and prioritized investment are really even more relevant today just due to the pandemic and some of the extreme socioeconomic impacts that we've seen across our region. As you know, um, the update meets our federal requirements. The purpose of the annual, of the every four-year update is to adjust our data to meet our current situations and respond to adjustments in regionally significant project status. We also take this opportunity to analyze and refine the financial plan for our region's transportation system, which has changed. Um, uh, we have seen an increase in the motor fuel tax. We've seen an increase in the federal infrastructure bill. A lot of those expectations were built into the financial modeling of the 2050 plan. So it doesn't necessarily increase the over total size of the pie, but there are some positive benefits that we are seeing here and that we'll be able to accomplish a lot of our goals and, and projects earlier. This spring, we shared with you our preliminary regional socioeconomic forecast data, which included some demographic and employment projections. This data really shows that less growth is projected in our region um, from our plan four years ago. There were also some significant shifts to population projections across our region. So we continue to refine our data using some strategic and innovative approaches, but you know, we continue to utilize the evaluation framework that we had set in place for 2050 for this plan's update. As a result, uh, we've confirmed about 70 regionally significant projects in this update, totaling more than $84 billion, which we presented to the Transportation Committee last month. When we take a closer look at our transportation system funding, we expect that the majority of, of those funds, about 96.5% of those funds, will go to support the existing system, which is operations, maintenance, and improvement and enhancements. With that last bucket of uh, representing just about three and a half percent for new roads, transit, and bridges across our region, which really means we need a strong understanding of the evaluation of the trade-offs between some of the projects, the policies, and our recommendations here. So we've been hosting some stakeholder workshops to get input from implementers, from government partners, advocates, and community-based organizations, and we'll continue to refine the projects and the projections in the plan next month. You'll see the draft update plan that will go to transportation, to the board, and to the MPO. 
It will then be released for public comment and stay open until late August. So as required, we'll have a public hearing, but we are also doing engagement activities along the way. So again, you'll have more details on that today, but wanted to give you sort of a preview of the top line items from that. And then I think lastly, just uh, before I transition back to uh, item 5.0, you know, we had a meeting of the Chicago Inclusive Regional Economy Group, which includes the Brookings Institution, the Chicago Community Trust, all of our county board chairs and the city of Chicago. We will have another meeting with all of them in July. Um, when we convened these organizations, we really wanted to talk about strategies related to our regional economy that are mutually beneficial and serve our seven county region. The goal is to work together to advance shared prosperity, growth and competitiveness, and economic inclusion for people who've left, been left behind. We'll be working with all these entities on some specific actions uh, to move our region forward and sharing those with the implementation uh, commitments with you later this year. So just wanted to let you know that that work is still ongoing. We anticipate another convening in July and hopefully we'll have some um, good work on shared collaborative economic strategies for the region coming out of that. So with that, um, I will turn it back to you, Chairman. Thank you, Erin. And again, correct, congratulations on that uh, session at the City Club. I heard it was went very well. Thank you on our behalf for the board. Any questions of Erin? If not, we'll move on to uh, next item on procurements and contracts, Angela. Hi, good morning, CMAP board. I'm bringing to you today four procurements I'm seeking your approval on. Uh, the first one is a contract with ADP to implement the agency's pay, uh, pay payroll system and human capital management system. It's a three-year agreement with an amount not to exceed $300,000. A couple months ago, we brought to you Ceridian as, a, as the uh, implementation provider. We were unable to uh, enter into an agreement with them. So we pivot to our number two vendor, which was ADP. And so today we're asking for board approval to enter into an agreement with them. Uh, secondly, we're requesting a cost increase in the amount of $52,000 with cities GPS for the Chicago Inclusive Regional Economy Outreach Project. This is related to the Brookings uh, Institute uh, project. We're also requesting a cost increase of $80,000 and a 13 month contract extension with Jacobs Engineering to complete the grade crossing feasibility project. And then finally, we're uh, seeking uh, approval to enter into a contract with Oaks Associates. Uh, they were the vendors selected to conduct the, re the uh, local community ADA self-evaluation and tr transition plan. It's a three-year project and the cost is not to exceed $236,100. So we're seeking approval for all four procurements today. Other, question, other questions on any of those items? If not, the chair will entertain a motion to accept all four of those uh, contracts. Is there a motion? So moved, Darch. Second, Motoring. <laughs> moved and seconded. Again, any final questions? If not, Aaron, call the roll, please. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Frank Beal? Yes. President Brawley? Yes. Mayor Darch? Yes. Paul Goodrich? Aye. Jim Healy? Aye. Nina Adamudia? Aye. Mayor Noak? Aye. President Reinbold? Aye. Mayor Rotering? Aye. Stephen Schaefer? Aye. Carolyn Schofield? Ann Sheehan? Aye. Matt Walsh? Diane Williams? And the motion carries. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Oh, to... sorry. This is Carolyn. I was, I couldn't get it unmuted. Thank you, Hi. Carolyn. Voting aye. Chair recognize that. Need quicker fingers there, Carolyn. <laughs> Under re reports of committees, uh, Alex Anson. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, thank you, Chair Bennett. Um, I hope you don't mind that my cat's joining the board meeting. She's very passionate about civic engagement when I work from home. Um, so the um, uh, newly restructured regional and uh, regional economic competitiveness and climate committees. They met in March for the first time and staff began to align each of the new committees to our strategic direction. Um, staff presented the agency's strategic direction and how it intersects with those committees. The committees approved the uh, 2022 work plan and meeting schedules. Staff then led each committee in a discussion on CMAP's approaches um, to 
increase access to economic opportunities by addressing structural barriers in areas of disinvestment and in um, advancing strategic objectives for regional climate action. Each committee provided helpful and structured written feedback following the meeting uh, with refinements to the approaches and proposed indicators to measure progress. Um, the transportation committee also met um, and the committee improved um, the uh, TIP amendment 2205, uh, administrative amendments 2205.1 and 2205.2. Staff provided an update on the implementation of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act formula and competitive opportunities. The committee received an update on the identification of onto 2050 regional significant projects and the draft benefits report. Uh, the coordinating committee also met this morning um, and again received an update on the implementation of the IIJA formula and competitive opportunities. Um, and we also reviewed a new annual report format that will align with the strategic direction. Uh, this template will be used and this format will be followed um, for the working level committees and the coordinating committee to annually report activities to the CMAP board. Um, this report template, I believe, has been included in the board packet. Um, the working level committee will continue to provide uh, refinement and accountability to CMAP strategic direction over the course of the next year with the first set of annual reports aligned to the strategic direction submitted to the coordinating committee and the board in 2023. As part of our committee restructure, CMAP is also aligning our future working groups to address the needs coming out of the IIJA legislation. We've completed our first round of assessing those highest needs and are going to continue forward with four working groups, uh, complete streets and safe streets. This one will address active mobility, um, the new funding set aside and other competitive opportunities. Um, we will also continue with a working group of the Transportation Technology and Operations Coalition, known as TTOC, uh, to, address congestion, the, to address congestion, mitigation, technology and in, innovations, and competitive opportunities in these areas. We will also convene a freight working group to deal with freight mitigation and operations, and a safety resource group to address our safety action agenda needs that have been strengthened in the legislation. That concludes my report. Are there any questions? Any questions? This is Jim Healy. Hi. I'm curious as looking at the committee structure, we have the CMAP board, then it comes down to the executive committee, and then the advisory level consists of the Council of Mayors and the Citizens Advisory Committee. I, I just want to re reinforce that the 800,000 unincorporated residents of, Dup of the metropolitan area have absolutely no representation on that level. So, I've mentioned it probably a million times since I've been on that I believe there is a role for the counties. In fact, you have meetings at the counties there, but yet at the advisory level, there's nobody there. I, I just wanted to get that across. Jim, thanks for that. I'll, I'll note that all of the county board chairs have a seat at the, the MPO committee and are appointed through that process. And so they, they do sit at that table and many of them do join us at that table. But all of the counties also have seats on the transportation committee through their DOT's working group. And the, the board members here are appointed through the counties as well. So while we don't have sort of a formal, you know, Open Meetings Act compliant council of counties, we do convene the county board chairs on a quarterly basis with their chiefs of staff or county administrators, and often they'll bring their economic development uh, groups. Um, and we have frank discussions. I think one of the things that's uh, valuable about that work is that it happens in a, in a meeting that is more advisory, um, whereas the citizen, well, let me clarify my language, advisory, but not Open Meetings Act um, required. So Citizens Advisory Committee is required per the legislation. Council of Mayors is required per their approval process of the transportation funds in our region. So I hope you don't feel like we're ignoring the committees. They do have lots of opportunities to provide and weigh in with our feedback and our working plan throughout the year. Okay, moving on to item seven, uh, plan update, Elizabeth, Scott. Hi, thank you, Mayor Bennett. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Scott. I'm a principal policy analyst 
in the Plan Implementation and Legislative Affairs Division uh, at CMEP, and I'm one of the people that's been helping to coordinate uh, the update for ONTO 2050. And in consideration of the fact, as Aaron mentioned, that we're gonna be coming back to you next month with a draft of the plan update uh, and requesting your approval to release it for a public comment throughout the summer, we thought it might be helpful to have a little bit of a 30,000 foot um, discussion of what all is included in the plan update. Um, uh, so that uh, you'll, you'll know what's coming in front of you when you get those documents to review. I mean, some of, some of you are old pros and some of you, this is your first time going through long range transportation plans. So we thought a little bit of um, extra information could be helpful. So I'm gonna give a, you know, kind of a broad update of what all is contained in the ONTO 2050 update. And then we'll end the conversation, you know, hopefully if you all are willing with a discussion about um, where CMAP should go next in terms of uh, regional planning. We have uh, in the FY23 work plan scoping for the successor plan to ONTO 2050. So uh, we wanna end, end with some kind of future focused thoughts on that. So if that gets any ideas bubbling, I thought I'd mention it now. Uh, next slide, please. So um, something that, that I think is helpful to clarify is that CMAP kind of has two dimensions. One dimension is a federally required metropolitan planning organization authority that comes out of the Federal Highway Act, uh, Aid Act of 1962, which essentially says regions uh, with communities over 50,000 people need to have some kind of coordinated transportation planning and investment structure. So this is the responsibility that um, you know puts us in position to help program funds throughout the region in a a coordinated and comprehensive way. Uh, we also have a responsibility that comes to us from the state of Illinois out of the Illinois Regional Planning Act, which extends our responsibilities beyond just planning for transportation to include land use and other kinds of quality of life issues that affect the region. And so the two responsibilities are deeply intertwined, but they kind of have some different aspects. Next slide, please. So ONTO 2050 is both a long range transportation plan in that it lays out the prioritization for the regional regions, uh, capital projects and expenditures in the transportation system. But it also does a lot more because it's a regional comprehensive plan under that kind of more uh, regional comprehensive planning uh, responsibility that we have. So for those of you who are around, you know, ONTO 2050 development was a major effort. We started it in 2015. We uh, did 33 strategy papers. We had a million committees. We engaged with over 100,000 people through an extremely extensive public engagement and visioning session and uh, you know, created recommendations that covered a broad range of topics in the community, prosperity, governance, environment, and mobility dimensions. We also established three principles inclusive growth, resilience, and prioritized investment that, uh, you know, we really think continue to endure. We think that effort uh, still stands, and this is still the direction the region needs to go in. And actually, next slide, please. Um, CMAP has further put effort into strategic direction, uh, developing a strategic direction in consultation with you all. You've had presentations about this earlier this year, uh, really focusing in on how we can impact uh, uh, particular areas within the plan under the umbrellas of transportation, regional economy, and climate. Um, and we're still committed to these, still focused on these, and we think that all of the policy work that was done for this is still good and still stands, uh, you know, for the, for the current cycle. Uh, next slide, please. So given that uh, per federal regulations, we need to update the long range transportation plan aspect of ONTO 2050 uh, in this October, we thought let's reaffirm the policy dimensions of the plan and then focus on the technical aspects that need to be refreshed. And here is a detailed schedule, which we'll show you also at the end, just to kind of, um, make sure that you all see the different steps that we're walking through here. 
the teams have been working on the different projects to update the long range transportation plan aspect of onto 2050 for about a year. And we started in March bringing preliminary deliverables um, to, to you all, to the MPO and to the transportation committee um, among others. And so what we are uh, walking towards now is uh, the, the draft plan update will come to you in your June meeting which, at which time we're hopeful that you'll give us the go ahead to release it for public comment. As Aaron mentioned, we'll have a hearing and do some things through the summer. Uh, and, but then we'll be looking to you all in October, 2012 to um, ap approve the update to onto 2050. So just so you're clear on the timing of what all is happening and, and where we are and where we're going. Next slide, please. And so, so even, even though we're not doing a full onto 2050 scale major effort with this, what we are doing is still a very significant amount of work. It's hundreds of hours, multiple staff, um, and they've been doing a great job pulling together the detailed planning uh, and programming work that we need to do uh, to you know, meet our federal requirements and carry on our responsibilities uh, properly. And so today I thought I'd talk about just a couple of the interlocking elements here, but all of these things that you see in front of you are different aspects of the plan update process. So as Aaron mentioned, updating our socioeconomic forecast. So how many jobs and how much population do we think we'll have in the future? Looking at uh, you know the air quality forecasts for how our transportation investments will be, uh, re-looking at what needs to go into our TIP, among a, num a number of other things. Um, but today we're gonna focus on indicators, uh, uh, system performance report, financial plan, and regionally significant projects. The next slide, and that'll just highlight, highlight these for us. And uh, continue, please. And so with the indicators, the, the idea of what I wanna share with you all today is just to give you a sense of how these different pieces uh, yeah, fit together. And so we assess indicators for the plan so that we can keep an eye on what is happening in the region with respect to you know, our long-term goals. Next slide, please. So ONTO 2050 has a lot of indicators somewhere in the neighborhood of 45, if I recall correctly. Many of them um, you know, have endured since go to 2040 because there's some things that are just important like what is the cost of housing and transportation for people in the region uh, but some were also added for onto 2050. I'll also add that for onto 2050 we also um, added something we call kindred indicators which is in any situation where the indicators that we track could be uh, disaggregated by race and ethnicity or income, we did that so that we could get that extra kind of dimension of understanding what's happening in the region. And so we went through all of them, updated their methodologies, refreshed all their data, took a look at um, what the trends were telling us uh, at, you know, as part of this update process. Next slide, please. And so one example, uh, next slide, yeah, thank you. Uh, one example of how we would use this information and, and why it's important for us to track and be aware of these things is uh, you can take a look at our, uh, num unfortunately, number of traffic fatalities chart. Uh, since 2010, unfortunately, our traffic fatalities have been ticking up and something this group has heard, uh, heard some, some about, I believe, is how surprising it was to everybody that during COVID, we thought with less congestion, maybe the fatalities will go down. Instead, they went up for a reason, you know, reasons that we could discuss uh, in a presentation about our safety action agenda, but I think it has to do with uh, more trucks, uh, people being more, uh, uh, extending their weekend behavior throughout the week because people's schedules changed and things like that. But in any case, tracking this indicator lets us know that this is an important thing that's going in the wrong direction. And it gives uh, emphasis to the work that we know that we need to do to uh, continue to address traffic safety issues in the region. And so we just keep a handle on all of these different things that are going on so we can understand where um, effort is most needed from CMAP and partners. Next slide. And so we also take a look at um, the condition 
of our transportation system overall, because that's an important input into understanding um, how much of our financial resources over the next 30 years really need to be expended in maintaining the system that we have. Next slide, please. So we are required as an MPO by the federal government to uh, make an assessment and set, set uh, condition and performance targets for uh, highway condition, highway safety, system performance overall, transit asset condition and transit safety, uh, you know, among other things. Some of these things are, we also treat as indicators. Uh, next slide. And so an example of how this information uh, informs what we're working on and what we're doing is um, that we, so you can, the chart here you can take a look at is bridge condition in the CMAP area under over the, you know, kind of plan planning horizon. And so you can see our most recent data shows that although we have less bridge, uh, bridge deck area in poor condition, uh, like much less than we did in the 90s, overall, the amount that we have in good condition uh, is, is, sim is similar to like 1992, which is not great. Um, and so uh, under understanding of these kinds of uh, system, you know, cause like as time goes on, if we don't fix things, the system degrades. And so to reach a state of good repair, uh, you know, it's gonna take a greater investment. It's important for us to know these things for, for that reason. So we track it across the different, different indicators uh, yeah, of, sy of system condition. And that is an input into the next, the next aspect. It's an example of an input into the next aspect. Next slide, please. So the financial plan for transportation is a really important part of the long range transportation plan update because basically what it does um, is lay out how much money we think we will have coming in over the next 30 years and what we think we need to use that money for. Next slide. Um, so, so you can see here on the expenditure, here's, a, here's kind of a conceptual, like simplified diagram of what we're talking about. On the expenditure side, we make an assessment and uh, you know, forecast of what's gonna be required to operate, maintain, and reach state of good repair with the transportation assets that we have today. Uh, what's going to be required to uh, do certain system enhancements. A lot of that is uh, like in certain like road technology investments, certain bikeway or pedestrian uh, investments, that kind of thing. And then finally, uh, in terms of the new capacity that we're talking about adding to the road system or the transit system, what those costs are gonna be. So we look at all of those expenditures and then we look at the baseline revenues. So money is coming from the federal government, from the state, and then uh, and forecast those out over the planning horizon. And then we also include a number of items that we think over the next 30 years, it's reasonable to assume may become available as policy progress continues to uh, identify and secure new resources for the transportation system. So Erin mentioned this in her opening. A great example of this is forever, CMAP has been advocating to uh, raise the motor fuel tax and index it to inflation. So that was framed as a reasonably expected revenue uh, up to onto 2050. And then sort of after that, uh, due to the advocacy of a number of groups, including CMAP, uh, once, once that resource was secured and rebuilt Illinois, we were able to move it into a baseline revenue because it's something that we can depend on in the future. So that's sort of the role, the role of this exercise is to think about what we need and think about what we have and then think about what kind of resources need to be um, identified and developed in, uh, in, in order to, to get us to the future that we know we need, the amount of resources we know we're going to need in the future. And so it Thinking about it as a budget is not really right because it's not as precise as you would need for budgeting. It's kind of a, more of an order of magnitude understanding of what, 
what are, what are the resources that we're going to need to accomplish our goals over the time horizon of the plan? And so the right way to think of it is a, a, more as a policy prioritization exercise than a budget exactly. Uh, next slide, please. So kind of looking more deeply into how we think the monies will be expended over the onto 2050 update uh, plan horizon. So this is the next 28 years. We're talking about a uh, overall pot of money that's about uh, $525 billion. So it's a lot of money, half a trillion dollars over, over the next 30 years for all of the investments in the system and here in the region. But uh, most, most of the money goes to operations, maintenance and state of good repair improvements, about 90%. And then uh, on top of that, we have additional investments uh, in enhancements and then the smallest category is adding new capacity. Next slide. And so you can see uh, here how the operations, maintenance and improvement and new capacity resources are divided between road and transit. Um, uh, for the most part, it's pretty even. On the road side, the maintenance and improvements uh, category is a bit larger because we have a number of expressways that are going to need to be rebuilt over the plan horizon. Excuse me. Um, on the new capacity front, we're expending about twice as much on transit new capacity as we are on roadway new capacity. So, so that's the you know sort of planned use of those resources. Next slide, please. And then coming back around to the reasonably expected revenues I was talking about before, in order to complete this program of work, we anticipate um, somewhere in the neighborhood of $30 billion over the plan horizon coming from uh, five reasonably expected revenues, which are the resources that we're gonna continue to do policy development um, on and recommend that the region adopt. And so those are continuing to develop uh, you know, where we think we need to go with the road usage, uh, road usage charge, which is to say, as vehicles continue to electrify, uh, a tax on gas is not gonna provide us resources for the transportation system. So CMAP has advocated and will continue to advocate a transition to a per mile uh, user fee for, uh, for cars. Uh, we are talking about an, uh, extending the sales tax base in the region to include additional consumer services in line with what other large states do. Uh, we're talking about establishing a regional transportation network company fee. So that would be a fee on Uber and Lyft. There already is one in the city of Chicago, but that could be a region-wide um, initiative. Uh, further, we're talking about as our highways are reconstructed, looking at different kinds of ways to uh, to toll those roads to both manage congestion and contribute resources to the transportation system. And then finally, we'll continue technical assistance and policy work to help communities throughout the region expand the use of price parking, particularly in uh, Main Street areas where it can assist with economic development. Uh, and so together, that's kind of the picture on the financial plan for transportation. Next slide, please. And so like, what are, what are we gonna do actually with the expansion resources here? Um, that is where, what brings us to the regionally significant projects kind of section of the plan update. Uh, next slide. So a regionally significant project, uh, it, which is something that we define in the plan development process, excuse me, is a major regional scale transportation project that either um, costs $100 million or more and expands uh, capacity on the national highway system or uh, fixed, fixed rail, fixed route transit, or just costs $250 million or more regardless of the facility or work type. So that could include um, highway reconstructions, for instance. Next slide. And so um, what happens in terms of how we determine the capital investments is uh, projects are proposed to CMAP generally by implementers like IDOT, CTA, Pace Metro, the county DOTs or CDOT. 
um, we take the proposals in, into, into our research analysis and programming team and evaluate them across uh, 30 metrics that relate to uh, the, the goals articulated into the ONTO 2050 plan. Um, the projects that are uh, greenlit to move forward enter what's called a constrained list. Uh, the term constrained is a federal term, which means that the MPO has green, greenlit your project and made it eligible for federal funding, but also to complete certain planning and engineering phases like NEPA, so your environmental review. These are um, pre-construction activities that are required for projects of this scale and without being constrained within the CMAP's long range transportation plan list that can present uh, challenges for plans for projects to move forward. So that's kind of like why we, why we look at it, why we do it, why we evaluate them, why we go through an iterative process with the implementers to come out with a total um, program of projects that we put under our fiscal constraint in line with the financial plan for transportation uh, and that gives us a portfolio of projects to move forward in the uh, over the plan horizon. So next slide, please. And then another important thing to understand is that because this process is updated every four years, there is from plant from long range transportation plan to long range transportation plan a certain amount of iteration that happens. And so we wanted to give you a couple of examples to illustrate how this can look under different scenarios. So for instance, you, uh, we have uh, four, four projects, which are real projects, but in order to not call anyone out here, we'll just put them as speculative projects. Uh, project A uh, is, I believe, a transit project that was introduced actually in GoTo 2040, and because the um, actual project development road for that is really long. They came in that plan, uh, the implementers resubmitted it for the 2040 update, they resubmitted it for 2050, uh, and then in between uh, the 2050 plan and the 2050 update, they began construction on, on the plan. And so throughout that process, the target year of construction, the amount of money that it would cost all kind of shifted as the implementers continue to get a more um, detailed understanding of what it would actually take to complete the project. So we've had it, you know, across multiple long range transportation plan pieces, and then it hopefully will complete construction um, before before the next long range transportation plan. But so in this one, it only includes the little bit of money that still remains um, that's required to complete that construction. Uh, let's see. Similarly, Project B introduced, refined the year, the construction year changed, the construction year changed, but, and now we're forecasted to complete this road project in 2025. Project C, on the other hand, was brought to us uh, as an arterial that was brought to us by an implementer for onto 2050. And as they proceeded through the pre-construction planning work, so engineering, trying to understand how this was going to look, um, decided not to proceed. But they needed to be a constrained project in order to proceed through those phases of project development, even though they decided um, not to proceed with the project ultimately. And so the project wasn't resubmitted for the 2050 update. And then finally, Project D is a very long range thing, which we think is going to happen in 2040. So it is, uh, was extremely speculative in the GoTo 2040 update and has been continuously refined by the implementers and likely will continue to be refined um, you know, over time as we move towards the uh, kind of D-Day for that project. So the point is that within the projects that are submitted to us, there are some projects that are in the very, very early stages, un unformed, and then there are some projects that are about to go shovel in next year. And, and, the, and we have to figure out a way to kind of treat all of them within the context of our federal responsibilities that have to do with programming. Uh, next slide. And so in this plan update, uh, we have 75 regionally significant projects, 25 transit projects. Those are the blue and green ones. 
24 expressway projects that's purple and uh 26 arterial projects. And so you can see that there is uh, work being funded through this portfolio in every part of the region, but a lot of it is investments um, in, in our legacy system. Uh, next slide. Uh, some of, I wanted to give you a couple of examples of the kinds of things that we're talking about here. So one project that's, that's very exciting that came to us for the first time in this cycle is uh, PACE is proposing to um, do some uh, work work on along 294, wherein they will uh, create, you know, kind of like evolve their former toll plazas into bus rapid transit stations. It will include, so phase, phase one will include two stations at the O'Hare Oasis and Schiller Park and uh, Cermak and Oak Brook. And phase two and three would include three additional stations in Chicago Ridge, Schaumburg and Alsip. And so basically this would, this would create bus, bus collectors uh, in these toll plazas and then let people kind of go in, along, along in a pace bus north to south along the tri-state. And, and so this was introduced for the first time, including it in the constraint list will allow it to proceed along project development. Uh, next slide, please. And then another big one we, that, is a, that is a part of this is a, many IDOT reconstruction projects, including reconstruction of uh, multiple highways. So it'll include pavement rehab, bridge reconstruction, interchange improvements, bus on shoulder implementation, and in some, case the, in some cases, the addition of managed lanes. Uh, this is, I believe, uh, Bishop Ford here, which is part of, uh, part of the portfolio of things to be uh, reconstructed over the plan horizon. So that just gives you a taste, a taste of what exactly we're talking about when we talk about these projects. Uh, next slide. So, uh, you know, the staff is busy at work completing these uh, update activities, you know, trying to have a good understanding on all of the technical pieces that we need to do and work with the implementers to have the uh, best portfolio of projects we can going forward, but it also means that we're thinking about, um, you know, the, what we need to do to get through public comment, what we need to do to bring this long range transportation plan to adoption in the fall. But we're also thinking about the next plan, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So a reminder, uh, in our, at your next board meeting, we will be asking you, we will, we'll share with you the, uh, a narrative that kind of encapsulates, it summarizes all of the activities that we've been doing and contextualizes the plan update um, in terms of what's been happening in the region with COVID over the next couple of years, and then gives you all of the appendices for the individual projects that we're, we've relied on to develop those um, long range transportation plan set of recommendations. So that'll come to you uh, for your, in your packet for your next meeting. We're hopeful that you'll be comfortable for us to go into the public comment process. And then as a reminder, we'll summarize all the comments we receive, we'll uh, give an update of how we've treated them, and then we'll be looking for you in the fall um, to hopefully uh, adopt the plan. And so that's, that's just a reminder, that's where we're at. But also in the summer, what we're gonna start, as I mentioned before, all too is scoping uh, scoping for the successor plan to onto 2050. So next slide. Um, we have been having, oh, thank you, Mayor, appreciate it. Uh, we, as Erin mentioned, we've been having um, quite a few round tables with both uh, advocates and community people uh, and public sector officials of different kinds. Uh, tomorrow, we're having a roundtable for the general public to get kind of their impression on some of these things. Uh, and, and what we're starting to think about is where do we need to go next? We know that uh, telework is changing a lot of things in the region. And we have to think about how our communities need to evolve, our policies need to evolve, perhaps our investments need to evolve. It uh, evolve because uh, you know because of the way people how people move around is changing. We know e-commerce is a huge factor uh, 
in what's happening in communities. We know people are concerned about warehousing and uh, the land use uh, issues that come with that. But we wanted to hear from you today and have a little bit of discussion um, about what you what you would like to see CMAP do that's forward looking, that is developing new ways of thinking. Are there problems that weren't weren't uh, kind of directly addressed in on two twenty fifty that you think need to be addressed now? We wanted to spend a little bit of time brainstorming with you all about where we should go for the next plan. And so that uh, concludes my presentation. I like to show a nice rendering. We have them. Uh, but yeah, if anyone has any thoughts or also any questions about any of the information that I share, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them, but, but really I'd love to hear um, what you think would be most helpful for us to begin to look at and get into as we're starting to think about where we go uh, here, because four years from now onto 2050 will be eight years old and that's too old. So. Thank Thank you, Elizabeth, Thank you. for walking the board through our process. I think we, we know that it's been a while since we've been through the 2050 process, but you know, really this update process is a stepping stone. It's evaluating where we have been in the region, what we've accomplished in the 2050 plan, and then like Elizabeth said, recognizing that so much has changed in four years, probably more than would have changed in a normal four years, um, and what tools, policies, um, work do we need to be doing collaboratively as a region to think about the future? So it looks like Leanne has comments, questions. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I just, thanks, thanks, Aaron, appreciate it. Just a quick question. How is the um, mobility task force work and recommendations coming out of that going to play into most, more importantly in the short term, the update to the plan, I guess? That's a very good question. Uh, so as many of you uh, may be aware, we also have a concurrent project that explores the impacts of COVID to the transportation system and is thinking about what kinds of uh, policy moves and investments we need to make to successfully uh, secure the transportation coming out of COVID considering some of the changes that have happened. And so how we have, because we had to go out for public comment with this document, in June, and we're still substantially within the policy development process for the mobility recovery. I think we're envisioning them as being uh, happening in parallel and that the emphasis in terms of new policy development will be on mobility recovery, but that uh, the plan update will leave open context for that and indicate that it's important. So we see them as, as lightly paired, but uh, that considering the timeline, I don't think it's critical for them to be closely joined. Well, I think too, just to build off of that, Elizabeth, is that the Mobility Recovery Task Force has been meeting to suss out what do we need to change? And I think we wanna use that as a grounding for what the policy platform needs to be building into the 2060 plan as well, because there'll be some short term things coming out of that that we can change in the near term and advocate for as a region, but there are probably going to be some long term things that we're going to need to spend to use that as research that helps support the 2060 plan development, if that makes sense. Other questions, comments? Elizabeth, thank you. It was a pretty extensive report and uh, I think the board's gonna look forward to uh, uh, the materials we're going to receive before prior to the next board meeting, which uh, again, by the way, is the last meeting for the uh, half year anyway. We will be off in July and August. So please, uh, you're very important to be at that June meeting or attend the June meeting for uh, a lot of business to take place. So again, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Mayor Bennett. All right, moving on, legislative update, Laura. So I am going to pinch it for Laura here this morning on the legislative update. Um, the Illinois General Assembly adjourned on April 9th after passing a budget, the budget implementation bill and a tax relief package. You know, the package included a couple things that I wanted to share with you all and just emphasize that are relevant to our work and our work with our government across the region. 
I think first, um, you know, directly impacting CMAP, the generally assembly, generally, the general assembly passed legislation requesting that CMAP work directly with RTA to develop and submit a report of recommendations to the state that talks about potential changes to the recovery ratio, sales tax, governance, fare structures, and any other items that would ensure the financial viability of the region's public transit system. Uh, it also stated that the report should address racial equity, climate change, economic development, um, and public engagement. Um, CMAP is required to have those recommendations adopted by the policy committee, the MPO committee, and delivered to the state by the end of 2023. I know, Leanne, our teams have been working on hard on trying to figure out how we scope this, where we might need consultant services to support us in some of these initiatives. Um, but we have already sort of hit the ground and are working to, to figure out how we deliver this report to the General Assembly by the end of 2023. Um, also, the, in the, on the legislative side of things, uh, the package provided a six-month temporary suspension of the inflationary increase to the state's motor fuel tax beginning on July 1 through December 31st of 2022. Just a bit of context here that the state's 2019 rebuild capital program, if you haven't heard me say this enough already, I'm going to say it again, doubled the size of the state's gas tax from 19 cents to 38 cents and included an inflationary increase that would raise the gas tax um, annually, uh, which is about like two cents per gallon. Uh, we've been monitoring the suspension um, to make sure that lost revenues will be backfilled by other state funding mechanisms um, that still go to the Transportation Renewal Fund. And the important thing about that is the Transportation Renewal Fund, unlike the road fund, has a dedicated, has created a dedicated mechanism to get transportation, those motor fuel taxes um, to transit in our region, which is also an important part of the Rebuild Illinois um, bill. Um, another piece of legislation that passed that impacts local governments would exempt local governments from the GATA requirements for awards, including capital appropriated funds made by IDOT to local governments for transportation projects utilizing either uh, state or federal funds. So I know that that was um, well received from our government partners. Um, two other pieces of legislation were approved that would allow IDOT, the tollway, and the counties to pursue a design build delivery method to expedite project delivery process. Currently, they use design bid build delivery method where the department designs a plan in-house, reviews bids from contractors. Design build really expedites that process by allowing a single entity to do both the design and start the construction. So you can sort of overlap the land acquisition at the same time as you're finishing up the design. And so it just expedites the process with project delivery. Um, projects that use this method would be capped at a total of $400 million at the state um, at the tollway level and would allow counties to make a two-phase design build selection process into one phase for smaller projects under $12 million. Um, related to our work on fares, fines, and fees on transportation, um, the state's earned income tax credit was increased from 18% to 20% and expanded to include eligible taxpayers between 18 and 25 years old and people over the age of 65 that would otherwise qualify but don't have children. So in our fair signs fees report that we had uh, put out about a year ago, expanding and increasing this tax credit makes the income tax system more progressive and is a strategy for mitigating against the regressiveness of transportation fines, fares, and fees. And then just a couple other notes on local government updates important to our government partners. The local government distributed fund was increased slightly from 6.06% to 6.16%. I know that our local partners have advocated this uh, for, for years for that to return to 10% as it was in 2011. It's the right direction. It's probably not enough, but um, again, wanted to highlight that that happened for those of you uh, care about those issues. Um, and then a piece of consolidation legislation passed that would require any tax levying body outside of municipalities and counties to form a committee to study, study local efficiencies and create a report with recommendations regarding those efficiencies, increased accountability, and potential for shared services consolidation. Again, uh, the committee's reports will need to be developed every 10 years per the state statute. Something, again, shared services is something we've been helping our, our partners work with uh, work on across the region and again it's something that we think is important um, as we think about the future. So again I uh, appreciate folks patience as we review the final bills and budget um, since we finished the session without Gordon or Anthony here although I think I saw Gordon 
And I think Leanne knows how to find Anthony. We're glad he found a good home at RTA, uh, which also reminds me, I should introduce Kasha Hart, um, who joined us. She just turned her camera on and waved as our new uh, government affairs senior here who will be working on our state and local issues. So in the future, you'll hear from Kasha on the state side of things. So thanks, Mayor Bennett. I'm happy to answer any questions if I know the answers to them. Any questions in the legislative? Other than the fact we will be back uh, next year with LGDF, that is not, will not ever go away until we are restored our, our proper revenues. All right, moving on to uh, item number seven, better equitable uh, engagement, Ryan. Hello, my name is Ryan Tomto, and I am the project manager of CMAP's equitable engagement program. Today, I will provide a brief update on the design of this program and discuss the next steps. Since the adoption of ONTO 2050, CMAP has been looking for ways to more extensively and more meaningfully engage with people who have historically not been at our decision-making tables. Study after study has shown that planning and policy efforts are more impactful and successful when more people, and particularly the people most directly impacted, are involved in co-generating solutions to local and regional problems. Governments at all levels have influenced distribution of advantage and disadvantage in American society. As a region's Metropolitan Planning Organization, or MPO, it is important for CMAP to recognize the past and present roles the agency has played in producing and perpetuating practices that harm marginalized communities. Without intentional intervention, institutions and structures will continue to perpetuate inequities. CMAP has the ability and responsibility to implement policies that combat the effects of bias and discrimination and to promote inclusive growth. Moreover, CMAP's core federal responsibilities connect to this work. Environmental justice is a federal requirement of federal, state, and local agencies and has legal basis in the civil rights and environmental laws, executive orders, and regulations shown here. The overarching goal of this equitable engagement program is to overcome barriers to more equitable engagement in order to drive more equitable outcomes and opportunities for everyone across the region. To achieve this goal, CMAP will work to build stronger relationships with environmental justice communities through sustained engagement with community organizations in CMAP's long-range planning and programming activities. CMAP will provide financial compensation to organizations for their time and expertise. This work will supplement CMAP's existing engagement activities. Last year, CMAP selected the Center for Neighborhood Technology, or CNT, to co-design and implement a regionally representative engagement program. The CMAP project team consists of 10 staff from all five of CMAP's divisions to ensure a variety of perspectives are brought to the table. The budget for this project is $548,000. Last year, CMAP was awarded a statewide planning and research program grant from the Illinois Department of Transportation that funds 80% of the total cost. The development of the program is divided into four tasks. The first task has been underway for the past year. During this time, 15 workshops were held with the CMAP project team to develop the program. In addition, an advisory group comprised of leaders of community-based organizations that serve historically marginalized populations have been engaged through a series of four workshops and multiple one-on-one -on -one consultations. As we near the end of the program design phase, we are preparing for the second task, which involves the recruitment and selection of participants for the program. Task three will involve the actual implementation of the program, including processing and tracking compensation to participating community groups. This is a critical element of the program as it must satisfy the requirements that come with federal funding. Finally, for task four, the Urban Transportation Center at the University of Illinois at Chicago will provide an independent evaluation of the program to determine whether the program has achieved its goals. For the initial two years of the program, CMAP will partner with approximately 12 community-based organizations that represent historically marginalized communities. For the program to be successful, the group must be representative of the region's geographic diversity. Participating community groups will be compensated $10,000 per year. 
The application and selection process has been streamlined to reduce burdens on participating organizations while also meeting federal requirements. Participating organizations are expected to either have nonprofit status or to have a fiscal agent who receives funding on their behalf. In some cases, such as rural areas with few existing nonprofits, units of local government, like library districts, may be considered community based organizations for CMAPS purposes. Participating organizations must represent communities that have been historically marginalized, represent the diverse range of geographies in the region, and demonstrate their commitment and interest in engaging in transportation planning and programming. In preparation for the recruitment portion of the work, CMAP staff are brainstorming ideas for how to grow awareness of the program, especially among prospective participants. The team has been thinking of how we can leverage CMAP's existing relationships and how to establish new ones. We're thinking of how to utilize CMAP's communication tools, such as the local government network, the website, newsletter, and social media. We're also thinking about how to develop a toolkit to make it easy for our partners to share information about the program on their platforms. We will be intentional about translating materials and we will find opportunities to meet with organizations at the places where they're already gathering to share information about the program and to learn more about their mission. As you can see, we have our work cut out for us. We are currently working to finalize the program guide, application, and recruitment plan. Recruitment of participants will begin in early June and carry through until mid to late July when applications will be due. Interviews will be held with applicants in August and September, and the selection of 12 participants will be completed by the end of September, with the goal of officially launching the program this October. Thank you for your time. As I mentioned before, we are currently thinking through recruitment ideas to ensure information about this opportunity reaches as many community organizations as possible that serve historically marginalized populations within the region. We invite you to share your ideas and any suggestions you have for community organizations we should connect with about this opportunity. We are also happy to answer any questions you may have. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Ryan. Any questions, Erin, I'm sure you'll respond. Uh, yeah, well, it looks like uh, Mayor Redring has her hand up, so we'll start there. Great, thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to really applaud this entire presentation and really appreciate the the, the thinking, the sentiment, and the mission that's been presented to us today. Um, I had a thought uh, when Elizabeth was giving her presentation, and I'd like to ask that that lens be placed into this as well. And that is, you know, as we look at the costs of providing resources for our roads and our transit systems. I wanna make sure we're not regressive in our thinking. I wanna make sure we're not penalizing folks who because of lack of affordable housing and other opportunities to live close to the places of their employment that they are then uh, suffering a disproportionate burden. So I just wanted to share that um, in connection with both this and the earlier discussion about resources. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Other questions? Thanks again. We will move on to other business. Any other business before the board, uh, Aaron, that we know of? No other business. Thank you. And I saw that Angela sent out a memo to the board members about their evaluations. They need to get those in ASAP. If you haven't done that, please do that. Yes. Under, pub under public comment, any public comment, Aaron? We have heard from a Kim Stone um, who has raised their hand. Thanks, Kim. Um, Thank you. Um, I'm Kim Stone. I'm a resident of Highland Park and a member of the Climate Reality Project Chicago Metro Chapter. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on item 7.01 on the agenda, the on to 2050 update. And I appreciate the presentation, which was excellent. Um, I'm glad that you included climate in the plan, given the short time frame we have left for climate action. But I was surprised to hear in the presentation that climate and transportation seem to be different sections of the plan, especially given that transportation is the, the current top source of greenhouse gas emissions in the US. Among the regionally significant projects are 122 additional lane miles of interstates and 55 miles of functional class two and class three roadways. This is not aligned with onto 2050's goals, nor with our region's climate action plan. CMAP's goals are inclusive growth, resilience, and prioritized investment. 
Building more roads and expanding existing roads is not inclusive. It serves only people who can afford cars and it disproportionately burdens certain communities with pollution. It is not resilient as it will lead to increased greenhouse gas emissions and it's not a good investment for our region. Just last year, the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus released a regional climate action plan which lists reduction in vehicle miles traveled as a core strategy. Widening roads as is being proposed here will do the opposite. When you expand roads, rather than reducing congestion, it leads to increased driving and continued traffic. This is due to induced demand. As supply increases and incurred costs decline, demand increases. This phenomenon has been widely observed and studied in transportation systems where highways have been expanded to alleviate road congestion. The shift calculator um, is one, one method to accurately calculate the impact of road expansions being proposed in our region. In addition, road expansion will increase maintenance needs, which are already a tremendous burden for our region, as was shown, for example, in the assessment of fridge condition in this presentation. Climate change is causing larger and more severe storms, which also increase maintenance needs on existing roads. We must start actively promoting bike and pedestrian improvements as an explicit regional priority for climate inequity. We could build hundreds of miles of bike lanes or sidewalks for the cost of one arterial widening project. Bike and pedestrian projects have also been shown to increase safety for all road users, which is especially important given the indicators of safety that were included in the presentation earlier today. Regionally significant projects should encompass projects that improve our regional transportation network as a whole. We should be asking how these projects better connect people to where they need to go, whether they improve safety and equity, and if they will help us meet our climate goals. Our region needs to be considering these factors when we decide how limited transportation dollars are allocated. CMAP's Transportation Committee received a letter last week on this issue signed by several environmental groups. And I encourage you to address the issues raised in the letter and in my comments before the list is finalized. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments? Not that we have received notice from in advance. Okay, for the board, our next meeting is again, June 8th. It is the last meeting technically of our, of our fiscal year. So please uh, make every effort to be in attendance. The executive committee will meet next and we have moved from go to meeting to Zoom. So please make sure you have that information when we conclude this meeting. So you're able to get on to the uh, executive committee meeting. With that in mind, Erin, there's nothing else I see here. You want to, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved, Rotaring. Second, Darch. Okay, moved and seconded. Erin, call the roll, please. Bennett? Aye. Uh, Frank Beal? Aye. President Brawley? Mayor Darch? Yes. Paul Goodrich? Aye. Jim Healy? Nina Edamudia? Mayor uh, Noak? Aye, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, aye. Mayor Noak? Aye. President Reinbold? Aye. Mayor Rotering? Aye. Stephen Schaefer? Aye. Carolyn Schofield? Aye. And, and Shan. Thank you, Carolyn. Aye. Matt Walsh? Diane Williams? Motion carries. So you guys can Motion carries. Thank you all. Uh, enjoy the rest of this beautiful day, and we'll uh, see you in one month. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. You. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.